This is always a little sad, the last day of Spiritual Renewal Week and the parting of many people to go various places. But many years ago, Swami and a small group of us visited another spiritual teacher who was then in Hawaii. And we were going on a round-the-world trip. I'm going to move this so you can get closer to okay. me. So he was going, uh, we were going on to a round the world trip and he gave us very good advice. He said, you have brought your light here and then it's been amplified by the light that we have. Now take that light and weave it around the world until the world is wrapped with light. And so I give the same advice to all of you. You've brought your light here and it's been amplified by this beautiful week, so deep and varied and uplifting. So now take that light with you and weave it around whatever part of the world you're headed to until the world is filled with light. This week's topic is, Who are the true Christians? Truth is one and eternal. Realize with oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. Jesus Christ said in chapter 10 of the Gospel of St. John, All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Many Christians, not surprisingly, quote this saying in condemnation of other spiritual teachers not only of the Old Testament prophets, but also of Buddha and Krishna and others who lived before Jesus, as well as, by inference, any who came after him. Yet Jesus himself said in St. Matthew chapter 5, <coughs> Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Nowhere do we find Jesus condemning or even gently criticizing other spiritual masters? His criticisms were reserved for worldly attitudes and for those hypocritical Pharisees who had allowed religion to become for them a pretense. Paramahansa Yogananda explained that the expression, all that ever came before me, referred to the, those spiritual teachers who placed their egos and their self-importance ahead of the Christ consciousness in the sense of drawing people's devotion to themselves and not offering it where alone it truly belongs, to God. Yogananda himself was very firm in this regard. For example, he never spoke of anyone as his disciple. Instead, he always insisted they are God's disciples. God is the guru, not I. 
Ego is a way station on the soul's journey toward enlightenment. The soul is first trapped in lower bodily forms. Slowly it evolves to the human level, at which point self-consciousness appears. Only in human form can self-consciousness transcend material form altogether, including the lower identity of ego consciousness, and discover the true divine self within. Self-consciousness is, man is manifested as ego is an incentive to deliberate self-development. Later in this process of development, however, the ego becomes an obstruction. Inevitably, new spiritual aspirants do not emerge effortlessly from the vortex of ego consciousness. Desire must be offered up resolutely and ever more wholeheartedly on the altar of infinity. It is a gradual process, and few, even among those who seek to help others, are free from ego. If, however, their motive in teaching is to serve, is not to serve, but to be served, they deserve a severe reprimand, as Jesus gave them, for their direction of development is no longer upward, but downward. In the name of giving up desires, they are creating new ones. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, in the third chapter, Desire obscures even the wisdom of the wise. Their, their relentless foe it is, a flame never quenched. Intellect, mind, and senses, these combined, are referred to as the seat of desire. Desire through them deludes and eclipses the discrimination of the embodied soul. O Arjuna, discipline your senses, and having done so, work to destroy desire, annihilator of wisdom and of self-realization. Give God the credit for everything you do. See him as the true doer. Thus through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. Om, Om, Om. I also want to wish you all a good morning and to thank, I loved what Timothy said last night, on behalf of everyone, we want to thank everyone. Because really, it's everyone creates this magnificent experience of Spiritual Renewal Week. And we form so many beautiful soul connections. And it is, it, it's a little wrenching to dissolve this vortex of spiritual consciousness which we all have created together with the grace of our masters but now it's time to approach another chapter in our lives so I will begin by reading from masters ever inspiring whispers from eternity <clears throat> this one is I vow never again to turn my gaze from thee I take this sacred vow. Never will I lower my love's gaze below the eyebrow horizon of my constant thoughts of thee. Never will I turn my uplifted inner sight away from thee. Never will I let my mind dwell on anything that reminds me not of thee. I will disdain the nightmare of ignorant behavior I will court all dreams of noble achievement, those of love, kindness, and understanding, for they are thy dreams. Though I dream many dreams, wakefully I will ever think of thee. In the sacred fire of constant remembrance, kept ever alight on my soul's altar, I will ever behold thy presence with the watchful eyes of devotional love. 
Thy grace has shown me that the dualities of health and sickness, life and death, joy and sorrow, are but passing fantasies. I am finished with those eternally self-canceling delusions. I am persuaded at last that there is but one abiding reality, thy eternal, ever-conscious, ever-new, ever-thrilling, infinite bliss. And that's an especially beautiful and powerful one. So, how do we go forward now? Because we've had inspiration in many, many forms throughout this week. And yesterday at the questions and answers, someone asked Swami the question, how do we continue the inspiration that we've had at Spiritual Renewal Week? And he said, meditate. And in a way it's simple, in a way there are many levels to that answer. First of all, on the surface level, to examine our personal practices and refine them and deepen them and dedicate ourselves more fully to them. You know, we were sharing with a friend in the early years, probably for the first 15 years of Ananda's history, Swamiji did every class, program, event, and initiation for Spiritual Renewal Week, if you can imagine. Every morning class, every Kriya, in the afternoon he would do personal counseling, and then every evening he would do whatever program, a concert, a slideshow, and it was really a marathon effort. And now it takes all of us to do what he did alone. But for the first 15 years, every Spiritual Renewal Week, his classes were virtually the same. He would talk about meditation and the Hong Sa technique, he'd talk about Om, he'd talk about preparation for Kriya, he'd talk about discipleship. And every year, these talks were different, they were deepening. But no matter how many times I still listen to his talks on the very basic, energization also, the very basic techniques, I always get something else out of them. So when we say meditate, if you're a beginning meditator, then go home and start a practice. If you're already having a practice, then look at it and go deeper with it and refine it. Because the beauty of yoga practices, it's not like learning to play tennis or learning how to, well, I shouldn't say that, it is in a way. But the point I'm getting to is, the more you do it, the more they reveal the depth to it. And I think that's probably true of anything. The more I cook, the more I understand how to cook better. The more I do anything, the more I understand how to do it better. So look at your practice. Don't be complacent. Complacency and indifference, are the uh, Master said, are the strongest arrows in, uh, in Satan's quiver. And so don't be complacent with your meditation practice. Every day, Master said, every day, try to make your meditation deeper. And I'm not saying this to instill guilt. I'm in saying this to motivate us. Because when someone asked me recently, I've been here for many years at Ananda and I just can't meditate. Well, the, there's a hard answer and a soft answer to that. The soft answer is, do your best. The hard answer is, are you tr really trying? Because if we really convince ourselves, this is important to me, and I will put it first on the stage of my life, we will be able to make progress. Master said, no one goes home empty-handed, but we have to pr do the work. And so, yes, meditation, but meditation is so much more than just what the time we spend before our altar. I like to think of meditation as mindfulness in every aspect of our life. We had so many inspiring examples given this week. When we eat our meals, to do it with consciousness, consciously be drawing that energy in. Do you remember um, in our, the class that Jatish and I did Tuesday, he mentioned 
uh, Frank Laubach, who wrote a wonderful book called Letters of a Modern Mystic. He was a missionary to the Philippines, and he started something called the practice, the practice of the Minutes, the Game of the Minutes, where he tried every minute for at least one second to think about God, mindfulness. And little by little, that practice became alive for him. And it wasn't just an effort of his mind or his will, but it was a living reality. There's another beautiful book that I like to uh, recommend to people called The Way of the Pilgrim. And I think it's a true story. It, it's the story of a little Russian peasant who goes to church this, uh, in the late 1800s, and he hears the minister, or the starets, as they're called in the Russian Orthodox Church, the monk, say, quoting from the Bible, we should pray unceasingly. And he doesn't understand what that means. How do you pray unceasingly? And so he goes and asks the starets, how do, you, how do we do that? And he is given this advice. Start out repeating this simple prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on me. That's one. You can take whatever one works for you. And he's given the advice, start by repeating it a hundred times a day. And he, and he said, then come back in a week, the monk tells him. So he does, and he comes back in a week. He said, now repeat it 500 times a day. And he does. And he said, and come back in a week. And on and on. And finally, after many, many weeks and months go by, the, uh, he doesn't have to go back anymore. Because this prayer has taken on a life of its own. And it flows with his breath. It beats with his heartbeat. And the rest of the book just describes his experiences wandering through the countryside, the people he meets, the experiences he has with this prayer as a constant living reality in our hearts. So mindfulness, as much as we can, Swamiji also talked about going on walking meditation. So when you're out in nature, enjoy the beauty and the beautiful Canadian geese landing on the lake and taking off. And uh, one year during Spiritual Renewal Week, there was a little family of skunks coming across the, the uh, draw there, the little uh, walkway. And they, you know, someone was giving a talk, and it was very hard to concentrate watching the little skunks. But as we are able to have this mindfulness, have a prayer going on with each step that we take, with each breath that we breathe, Yoganandaji recommended that we all memorize his poem, Samadhi, one of the greatest spiritual pieces of uh, literature. I mean, it's not fair to call it literature. That so understates what it is. It's a description in poetic fo form of the state of samadhi. Master said, memorize it and repeat it every day until it becomes a part of you, a living reality. Some years ago, many, many years ago, in fact, um, I, was, I had memorized it and I was walking and repeating it to myself. I was back visiting my mother and father who lived in St. Louis, Missouri, and I was just walking on the little sidewalks of the suburb in which we lived, my family lived. And I had my eyes half closed, and I was repeating that beautiful poem. And there's a line that says, The sparrow, each grain of sand, falls not without my sight. And just when I said that, my foot, I felt a little something under my foot. And I looked down, and there was a little sparrow, a little dead sparrow that had fallen. And I just touched it with my foot. And it was as though I, it was such a profound experience, because I thought, you're listening. You, it's not just me saying it. The universe is responsive. And the more we are aware of that and the more we try to put out our soul call, the more it responds to us consciously and, and demonstrably so that we know it and we see it. And it isn't just, did you do that? You, it's real. And so to draw consciously from the food we eat. You know, we talked about Frank Laubach. Um, one of our dear friends, Catherine, who is visiting from Seattle this week, her parents were 
like Frank Laubach, were missionaries. They were spent many years in China. And they went to a conference of Christian missionaries, and the keynote speaker was Frank Laubach. And before the meal, someone asked, I'll call him Frank. Um, I was going to say Mr. Laubach, but I don't think he would like that. I'll call him. For, uh, they asked Frank if he would lead the blessing before the meal. And Catherine's father, who was a minister and devoted his life to serving God, so not a man who God was distant from his thoughts, he said it was the most remarkable experience because it wasn't like he shifted from his regular consciousness and said some prayer and some deep and powerful voice that ministers use. But he, they said it was as though he just was picking up a conversation that was going on in his mind all the time with God. And it was so personal and so intimate and so not religious, but so profoundly spiritual. And so to have that conversation going on all the time, become the friend of God and share every experience with him, no matter what happens. There was a, another dear friend of mine, Jackie, who's visiting this week, told us a story of, remember we mentioned Corrie Ten Boom, who wrote the book The Hiding Place. And she and her sister and father were imprisoned and and suffered dearly in Nazi concentration camps. And her father and her sister died, but she survived. And then she went on to uh, have a, a mission throughout the world, uh, just spreading the power of God's grace in our lives. And it wasn't, she was an older woman, and she wasn't in good health herself, but she traveled all over the world. And at one point, this is the story that Jackie shared with me, she was in Japan, and she had to give a lecture, and there were many people who had come. And they hired, and they, no one spoke English. She didn't speak Japanese. And they hired a translator to translate for her the talk she was going to give. And at the last minute, something happened, and the translator couldn't come. So very hurriedly, they found another one. And then that person couldn't come either, and she had to give a talk in ja to the Japanese. And, there was nothing to be done, and so she just went out there and she just said, Lord, you're, you've been my ally, you've been my strength and my comfort in so many situations. Surely you won't let me down now. And she just gave a talk from her heart, and afterward, all the pe many, many people came up to her and said, we didn't know you spoke flawless Japanese. And she said, but I didn't. And they said, well, we understood every word you said. You're, it, it was just perfect Japanese. And how does that happen? Because the Lord's presence is there to make up our deficits, to, to, tie, to ease us over the last step, that we just think we can't do that last step. But then, as well as meditation, and mindfulness, and living in the presence of God. So remember, Swami also said, he, someone asked him, how do you develop devotion? And he said, to develop devotion, you need to stop being devoted to yourself. Because the spiritual path is too narrow for God and the ego to both walk on it. He didn't say that, but... He said that in other circumstances. And so that's an interesting thought. Mindfulness is important, but the heart. If we want to know God's with us, if we want to really be true Christians, as our passage read, we have to be able to give God the first place in our life. And sometimes people, surprisingly often, say, I don't understand devotion. I don't, I don't know how to express devotion, or I, I, it, it feels un, like unknown territory. Well, you know, let's think of this. If you want to develop devotion, you have to love God more than you love yourself. And if that's too big a step, then you have to love something more than you love yourself. 
Whatever it may be, start with things you understand. Start with friends or family or pets or a stranger or somebody that just looks like they need help. But give love and that, that primes the pump because when love starts flowing through you to anything, to anyone, then it opens the heart so that we can expand and begin to develop a heartfelt relationship with God. Someone shared with me, and I must say I'm so grateful to my friends who are always sending me inspiring stories and telling me beautiful stories that I can share them with others. But a friend of mine, Laura Herman, sent me a beautiful little audio tape, and it was by Jack Corn, a little brief talk by Jack Cornfield, who does, has done a lot of work with hospice and written books about death and dying. And this was a true story that he experienced. He was living in Seattle, and there was a very well-respected and holy Tibetan monk, Tibetan Buddhist monk, who was living in the Seattle area. And he was just such a loving, kind, peaceful man. And everyone just revered him. And at a certain point, this monk was diagnosed with cancer. And the doctor said, well, let's begin with some chemotherapy. So they, he went in for the treatment, and they stuck the needle in his arm. But as soon as they began the treatment, he kind of became a different person, and he became very angry and violent, and he ripped it out, and he was screaming at the doctors and pushing away the people and ran out. And no one, everyone was so surprised because it was totally uncharacteristic of him. And then his wife came up and explained to the medical staff. She said, please forgive him. He spent 17 years in a Chinese communist prison, and he was tortured, and his first wife was murdered, killed, and tortured. And when he was in the hospital with people in uniforms and being his arm tied down, it brought all that up again. And he, he, hasn't, he hasn't been able to release those memories. And Jack Cornfield was assigned to care for him. He wasn't going to go back for any more treatment. And he asked him, what can I, how can I help you? And the monk said, he was an old man, he said, teach me how to love again. And Jack Cornfield said, they don't teach us that in nursing school. <laughs> but how can I do it? And he said, take tea with me. And he described that, we've probably many of us know that Tibetan tea is very, very strong and very bitter and they put uh, fermented yak butter in it and salt, and it's not a taste that's uh, relishable to people outside of Tibet. But every day Jack went over there, and he and the monk and his wife drank tea together. And other hospice workers came, and they cared for him. And then the springtime came, and Jack asked the monk, in Tibet, how do you do healing in the spring? And he said, well, we believe that the pollen from the opening blossoms, if we sit downwind from it, it blows and we, our body receives that pollen and we become healed. And Jack said, I will find a way we can do that. So he began calling nurseries in Seattle. I have a friend who just wants, a Tibetan Buddhist monk, who just wants to sit in the nursery in the direction that the wind is blowing. And most of them say, oh no, we don't want to bother with that, we don't want to bother with that. But then a few, one said, okay, he can come. And so they said, he sat there and he just let the fragrance and the pollen blow over him. And then some time later another nursery said, yes, he can come here. And then the first nurseryman called and he said, can he come back? He said, I've bought some special chairs where he'll be comfortable. And then the word started getting out, and all over Seattle they wanted him to come. And then after some time he went back to the doctor, and the doctor did checks on him. He was totally cured. And, and Jack Kornfeld said, can you explain to me what happened? And he said, well, you taught me how to love again. 
taking tea with me, all the kindness of the hospice workers, the kindness of the people in the nurseries. He said, I forgot that people could be kind. And the memory of the hatred and the fear and the, all of that, it's gone now. So if we want to know how to find devotion, Find simple ways to share it with other people. Invite the stranger. Christ says, even that which you do for the least of these little ones, you do unto me. So kindness to a stranger is devotion to God. Forgetting yourself in serving someone else is devotion to God. But without that, if it's only a mental practice, it can become dry and we will inevitably walk away from it. But we say, we quoting Christ, what is the greatest of all prayers? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, remembering him all the time, with all thy soul, and Yogananda explains that's with the consciousness, and with all thy strength, and that's the life force that flows through us. Floating on the breeze of bliss, that life floor, force flowing through us, directed toward God. This is how we continue the inspiration of Spiritual Renewal Week. And it's up to you. We can't do it for you. I have to do it for myself. Swamiji has to do it for himself. Jyotish has to do it for himself. And you have to do it for yourself. The harvest is plenteous, it says in the Bible, but the workers are few. Let's be workers in the divine field. And to paraphrase a beautiful line from Swami's, one of Swamiji's songs, I Live Without Fear, the dancers will pass, the singing will end. I welcome tomorrow with you for my friend. So whatever tomorrow brings, if we live in the remembrance of God, if we give God our whole heart without any condition, not I will love you if you act this way, but I will love you unconditionally because I know that you are my friend. I welcome tomorrow with you for my friend. Let us part in this consciousness and go forward with the ability to dedicate your life ever more completely to God and our Guru. Oh.